oranges require orange to be. They are a color expectation. If an orange is not orange, it is no orange. Oranges originated in China, where they were crossbred from a mandarin and a pomelo as early as the fourth, the, the fourth century BC. From there, oranges passed from Sanskrit through Persian to Arabic. Traveling with the Moors, naranjas soon dotted Al-Andalus and Sicily. Oranges arrived in England from France in the 14th century, their bright skins holding a taste of a color that became popular in markets, on palettes, and eventually in tongue. For centuries, oranges were orange, but still orange was not a color. It was called yellow-red. It took another 200 years for the color to earn its name, to become a form that could give itself to others, to be ascribed to flowers, stones, minerals, and the setting sun. To the West, oranges followed the path of Spanish missionaries to the Americas and lent their name to Orange County and the Orange State. In California, the fruit fed the miners of the gold rush who passed through the mission towns. In Florida, there were so many groves that by 1893, the state was producing five million boxes of fruit each year. In this tropical climate, nights too humid and too hot, oranges would ripen too quickly. They were ready to be eaten while still green. And so, from the 20th century onwards, green oranges have been synthetically dyed orange, coated to match consumer expectations. Orange oranges reveal that humans cannot imagine a species detached from its color, even when we are the ones who detach it. Amid all the observations about industrialization and its consequences, the following is rarely heard. The world's colors are shifting. We grew up coloring in pictures of the world. Trees are green, um, oceans blue, and yolks yellow. <clears throat> that everything else in life is turned regularly upside down, it's only tolerable because oranges remain orange and the sky blue. An increasing amount of industrial energy is directed towards dyeing the world in natural colors so that life and commerce may proceed. But dyes may miss their mark. Shifting cues in flesh, scales, skin, leaves, wings and feathers are clues to the environmental and metabolic metamorphosis around and inside us. The force that is color is not for domestication. It is fugitive. Color colors outside our lines. As Esther Leslie put it, color is fragile and contingent. Color is fleeting, fugitive, unstable, more attuned to the memory than the objective world, always escaping or seeping away fading as night falls or when the sun shines too brightly. Chemists struggled to make it last. Color is motile. And in the realm of color, chemical color, synthetic color, nothing remains the same as it was yesterday. In 2018, an eye-catching sparrow was spotted on the Isle of Skye in Scotland. This sparrow was bright pink. We know what sparrows are supposed to look like because they have evolved together with us. Over several millennia, food scraps from human settlements attracted sparrows from the wild, which mutated into new species. House sparrows have since become a familiar sight wherever humans dwell. They metabolize the shades of our settlements into their brown-gray feathers. They are drabber than their older tree sparrow cousins who preserve their brighter tones of the forest. But the pink sparrow, neither forest nor house, was actually a color leak. The sparrow had turned salmon. Salmon are at home in color. Whipping her tail, a female salmon spent two days making a depression in the riverbed called a red where she deposits her eggs. Fertilized, these red spheres of nutrients encasing young salmon who eat their way out, taking the color inside. Once the eggs are depleted, salmon swim to the ocean in search of food. 
There, they feed on red print crustaceans, mostly shrimp and krill, as well as small fish with even smaller crustaceans in their digestive systems. From these, they absorb yellow, red, orange fat-soluble pigments called carotenoids that tint salmon, salmon. Salmon record their location by metabolizing these shades. Their flesh is color coordinated with their journey. If salmon could peer inside their own bodies, they could distinguish from their muscle tones the Trondheim Fjord from the sky or the Bering Sea. When salmon are ready to breathe, they stop eating. Their stomach shrink to the size of a finger to make room for roe and milt, and they are drawn back to their birthplace, searching for home against the currents. The swim upstream requires such great exertion that it pushes red pigments to the surface of the salmon's skin, a sign of health that actually lures mates. Female salmon pass on carotenoids in their flesh to plump their row and make it attractive to prospective males. Color then streams through generations, linking salmon to their red. Salmon, the color, is a pathway, both metabolic and geographic, of being. It is the atmosphere in which salmon are born and die. Color in this cosmos, then, is more than cosmetic. It is a biological influence as strong as memory. Salmon is a means by which color moves according to the logic of ingestion. Salmon metabolize their color, literally drawing life from it, and humans, craving this color species, consume an image of health. Such is the human thought of salmon. Scales encasing ink-perfect pink flesh, a river leaping with fish on the run, a color bound to a body, a body bound to its own name. On the Isle of Skye in Scotland, however, this pictorial logic is fading. Sky no longer runs salmon. Populations have fallen to historic lows, and corporate aquaculture has filled the waters around the island with intensive open net salmon farms. Salmon, the color, the fish, is a red herring. Open net fish farms are flow through feedlots. Enclosed in pens with one to 200,000 other fish, a salmon cannot feed on krill and shrimp. Here, a salmon is naturally deprived of astaxanthin, the carotenoid that makes crustacean pink and protects its body from solar radiation and stress. A salmon's color then reflects its well-being. Darker pink salmon represents access to astaxanthin-rich crustaceans, where pale pink salmon represents a lack of nutrients or high stress levels. Farmed salmon lacking these resources are no longer truly salmon. Their flesh tone is now closer to white gray than red. Salmon the fish are cleared of salmon the color. Pigmentation in farmed salmon also profits from being photo manipulated. Consumer demand requires fish all year round, and so many farms in northern latitudes mask the seasons through artificial light. Fluorescents mimicking summer sunshine are turned on and off. On and off. On and off. On and off. And on and off. Most salmon do not know seasonal darkness in their brief 18 months of captive life before the slaughter. In northern latitudes, 100,000 lumen bulbs are an ingredient in a lighting recipe that creates unseasonal, summer-like atmospheres. For farmed salmon, a year might have two summers and skip a winter. Under the weight of accelerated growth, farmed salmon spines curve, eyes wrap, Tails shorten and jaws bend. More than 90% of farmed fish can indeed be considered deformed. Fused and compressed, vertebra twists bodies to such an extent that salmon struggle to swim. Parasites like sea lice thrive on salmon bodies when they are crammed in the confines of the pen, easily multiplying as they jump between hosts. These parasites feed on the skin and blood of salmon causing lesions, stress, and in some cases, killing entire populations. The lesions, which make fish aesthetically unappealing and unmarketable, 
are the biggest problem for farms. And increasingly, poisonous toxins to fight disease and parasites are added to feeds and metabolized in the flesh. Another way to target parasites is through the use of laser beams. These optical Delausian devices go on and off, on and off, on and off, and on and off. The farm's light regime is therefore a paradox. As growing seasons extend and fish multiply, parasites thrive and more light enters the fray. Light necessitates light to keep up with market speed. Hundreds of kilos of feed, particles, and antibiotics, which are distributed through hyper-efficient automated feeders that detect when the fish are hungry, below out into the surrounding water. These create chemical runoffs from these toxic toilets that lead to disease and mutations in surrounding fish populations. Salmon farms now dot the coasts of Scotland, Iceland, Chile, Ireland, Canada, and Tasmania, but they also affect the waters and lands of other countries from South America to West Africa. Trawlers off the coast of Peru or Senegal, which sustainably source anchovies for feed in pellets are depleting local fish populations and the small-scale fishermen dependent on them, forcing them to migrate to survive. The anchovies are mixed with soy protein from Brazil's Cerrado tropical savanna, which is being cleared from farmland at the rate as 50% faster than the Amazon. When the Scottish clearances happened some 200 years ago, thousands of Gael people were dispossessed, evicted from their villages, and um, banned from living off the land as they used to. Sheep became more valuable than people. Today, salmon farming corporations are replicating a similar process by clearing the seabed, and more and more dead zones are appearing all around salmon farms. This new wave of clearances is a multi-billion business for a few, but invisible to humans above water. Salmon are bred to be hungry. Their job is to put on weight at any cost. Feeding salmon is a landscape-consuming practice at a planetary level. As a global commodity, farmed salmon defies any attempt to be pinned down to any particular geography. Scottish salmon today does not entirely come from Scotland. Salmon hatching row is part of an intricate transnational network of precious genes with color pigments and eggs fertilized and in, incubated in different facilities ready to be sent from farming site to farming site to farming site across the world. Scottish salmon today then is neither entirely Scottish nor is it wholly salmon. An inventive marketing around the origins and quality of farmed salmon has emerged in the UK. The Scottish Salmon Company has branded themselves as purveyors of authentically Scottish salmon, despite being registered in Jersey, owned by a Swiss bank with Ukrainian and Norwegian investors, floated on the Oslo Stock Exchange and used imported Norwegian genetic material for their farmed salmon. Greek seafood Hjordland sources salmon from the wild waters of Shetland, but um, wild here refers to the water and not the fish itself. It is no surprise then that Marks & Spencer's salmon brand name is Loch Muir. Indeed, a Scottish wilderness sounding name but Loch Muir is a place that does not exist on the map. Aldi promotes Best of Scotland salmon with an image of a fishing boat when it is actually farmed in Scotland and the Faroe Islands. Morrison's promotes catch of the day salmon, which is sourced from farms in Norway, and Scottish quality salmon, which is farmed in Norway, but only smoked in Scotland. Scottish salmon then has become a brand that needs to be critically rethought, not only from an environmental and ecological perspective, but also questioning what Scottish and salmon mean in that construction. Salmon is a species cleared of the metabolic processes that constitute salmon, both color and fish. It is our desire for color which eventually landscapes the environment. In natural habitats, animals use color to attract, warn, or camouflage. The absence of a color indicates sickness, a body removed from the social functions of an ecosystem. In captivity, where mating is replaced by artificial insemination and predators by disassembly lines, most color fades. Yet the human eye, to the human eye, a body without color is no body. So if food lacks color or the body lacks the food that contains its color, then the body needs to be color fed. 
the equation feed conversion ratio is a tool to quantify the success of farmed salmon. It indicates the precise quantity of feed pellets, around three kilos, that equates in biomass gain, which is around one kilo. It is the efficiency ratio by which feed is best converted into food and color. These bodies, neither beans nor objects, are the synthesis of ecology and economy. Living matter becomes a dislocated liquid volume cascading through planetary pipes that connect oceans with disassembly lines, mills with packing facilities. Chicken and pigs are fed ground up fish. Fish are fed ground up chicken and pigs, and fish are fed ground up fish. Millions of tons of animal travel the world as animal feed, and in every step, color additives are supplementing the food deficiencies that each industrialized species has, coloring the flesh that flesh ingests. Feed is not just food, whether for humans or animals. It is a logistical operation that transfers matter from place to place and body to body. Dying and digesting bodies become a color machine that process and propagates images of their wilderness, the fashioning of which they no longer control. The little pink sparrow in the sky appeared at the end of one of these voracious food chains. Its salmon feathers were a color leak, a sign. In farms, the colored salmon leaves outside the fish. Gray salmon must be fed an imitation of the natural color. And so farmers cannot afford to feed salmon, krill or baby lobsters. And so since the 1970s, synthetic astaxanthin has been used to stain salmon in multiple pantones of salmon. At once gray and pink, they are salmon. 15 hues classify salmon following 15 shades of pantones. You are looking at Pantone 1555U. Are looking at Pantone 1565U. Are looking at Pantone 1625U. Are looking at Pantone 1635U. Are looking at Pantone 1575U. Are looking at Pantone 487U. Are looking at Pantone 486U. Are looking at Pantone 1645U. Are looking at Pantone 157U. Are looking at Pantone 1655U. Are looking at Pantone 158U. Are looking at Pantone 1665U. Are looking at Pantone 485U. Are looking at Pantone 2347U. Are looking at Pantone 2028U are looking at the 15 pantons of salmon. The Salmon Fund trademark is a universal system used by the salmon industry to apply synthetic salmon tones to fish. Darker-hued salmon fed more as the santin are more expensive and the lighter shed and then the lighter shades, while salmon lower than 23 on the scale are difficult to sell at any price. The salmon palette was invented by Hoffman La Roche, and after decades of producing food coloring and medicines derived from um, petrochemicals, La Roche took a special interest in synthetic astaxanthin in the 90s. Their salmophan scale allows salmon farms to decide the precise amount of astaxanthin to feed fish according to the tastes of their market. Later, La Roche sold Samofan together with their vitamins and fine chemicals division to Dutch estate mines, which was originally set up as a coal mining enterprise. Today, DSM markets synthetic carotenoids as nutritional products for salmon and shrimp under the trade name Carophile Pink. Humans taste with their eyes, just as much as with their tongues. And in DSM's own words, Color is essential to the sensory, sensory perception of quality. Salmon, the color, the flesh, the fish, the system, is an image produced by an and dependent on generic geographies. We paint the world in colors we expect to see, and in doing so, we color our expectations. Yet, farmed salmon struggle to achieve the perfect salmon, salmon that consumers demand of their flesh. Their color is affected by levels of anxiety, exhaustion, and crowding in the farm. And these stresses create their given color by reducing their metabolization of astaxanthin. 
homogeneity in color among salmon, even in the same farm, is almost impossible, so faulty colors may appear. At the time of slaughter, 10 to 30 percent of salmon have black spots in their muscle fillets, a sign of tissue damage. No one wants to eat fish colored with polka dots, and so they are discarded. Color is all that matters. The salmon sparrow in the sky was a warning signal of this very possibility, a body consumed by the color of another species, a red flag. In 1856, William Perkins was trying to synthesize quinine as a treatment for malaria. In the process, he accidentally isolated mauve from coal tar, unleashing the colors held fast in the sludge of energy. Little did he know, this would come to be called aniline and would be the base of a synthetic color revolution, as well as the origins of almost all chemical and pharmaceutical companies. Turning coal tar into color was far more rewarding than any alchemist could have dreamt, providing the means by which the world could be totally repainted. Coal tar's darkness, as Esther Leslie claims, was the origin of a color rush. The rainbow could be extracted from the mine rather than the colony, and a seemingly new world order began in which pigment took hold at the molecular level. The color industry reached its explorative heights in Nazi Germany when ACFA, Bas, Bayer, and other coal derivatives companies consolidated into IG Farben, Farben uh, for colors in German, and instrumental to and the instrument of Hitler's regime, IG Farben created everything from dyes to paints to food colorings. Using slave labor from concentration camps, it revolutionized the standardization and commodification of color while also manufacturing Zyklon B, the deadly poison of the gas chambers. Since the advent of industrialism, color has been moving. It fades and it is fed, but it also morphs and changes, signaling environmental shifts. The most famous interspecies toxic class struggle of the 19th century is that of the moth. As factories rose between London and Manchester, both town and country darkened. Walls and streets were blackened, and the white lichen on the barks of trees on which white moth lurked faded. Formerly camouflaged, they became easy prey, and the rarer kind of moth with black spots of melanin took their niche. By 1848, fully black specimens had become a common enough sight in Manchester that they were classified as their own species. Opposed to the white-bodied typica, the normal, the black-bodied moth was named Carbonaria, as if carried by the billowing plumes of chimneys and smokestacks, carbon gave itself to another form, animating carbon color, and by the end of the century, Carbonaria almost twice outnumbered typica. The struggle of the peppered moth signaled an eco-chemical crisis. The moth mothed into atmospheric pollution. Industrialism, an unprecedented release of energy into new systems, classifies. It counts, groups, and naturalizes differences that emerge as environments transform. Classification depicts the new in the context of the existing. It domesticates and depoliticizes the struggle of adaptation. Like wilderness, it organizes life into a static image. The irony is, we cannot imagine a species removed from its color, because we taxonomize, at least at first, visually. Like moths, mothing moth, pigeons with darker feathers are now reproducing faster than their lighter fellows. They pigeon pigeon. Melanin is pigment, but also protection, drawing the ions of toxic trace metals from their bodies to their pinion. Zinc, and sometimes lead, deposited in their wings, color coordinates them with their urban environment. And even after death, birds keep atmospheric toxins in their feathers. And we can read the composition of urban air in the way that feathers feather toxin. 
Ornithologists along the east coast of the US have noticed that some yellow feathered birds have begun to molt crimson. Like the salmon sparrow on sky, their body color and their species color no longer align. As temperatures rise in the area, plant life has adapted and red honeysuckle berries now pro proliferate. When woodpeckers and waxwing feed on these once uncommon fruit, they metabolize rhododaxin, a red pigment that alters the color of their feathers. When yellow woodpeckers feather invasive berry, we can tell that berries are turning rising temperatures. Color no longer flows through bodies, but rather bodies are flowing through color. In our post-industrial era, the amount of toxic substances circulating through bodies is such that bodies are the ones circulating through chemicals and not the other way around. Likewise, instead of bodies metabolizing color, it appears color is metabolizing bodies. A bright pink foam of lead, cadmium, nickel, and mercury runs into India's Yamuna River from textile factories. This runoff leaches into the soil, warming up roots and making the vegetables that grow in the field nearby taste fast fashion. Fast fashion flows from the river to the plants, to the textiles workers who eat them and back out again. In Mumbai, fast fashion metabolized 11 dog bodies, the strays who swam in the Kasadi River to cool down amidst the summer heat and then turned cyan blue. As low-cost fast fashion producers concentrate their facilities in countries with cheap labor and lax environmental regulations, it is not uncommon to see rivers running trendy seasonal colors. And so the dogs that swim in must-wear color rivers become must-wear color dogs. Red Hook in Brooklyn had an incredibly hot summer in 2010. Flowers and blossoms withered, and hives in the area began to glow incandescent red. It seemed that starving bees had rest resorted to a non-floral food source. As the Brooklyn bees fed on cherry syrup from a nearby factory, red 40 petrochemical colorant metabolized bees, honeys, and hives. At the ends of the Earth, chromatmospheres show signs of a new bipolar order. In the Arctic, air losing its transparency due to suspended chemicals distorting the trajectory of sunlight is a snow. Ocean water pollutants accumulated in fat erodes the skin of white seals, causing fading. What seems like an orange snow rust is actually parasites thriving in rising polar temperatures. The Arctic does not Arctic, Arctic white any longer. Flamingos raised in captivity lack access to astaxanthin rich algae. So zoos feed them flamingo to keep up with visitors' expectations. Just as farmed salmon, 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 flamingo, flamingos, flamingo. In the meantime, the algae that gives flamingo their distinctive salmon color are the latest wonder ingredient in human beauty products. You can now flamingo your skin, hair, and nails. Our skin biologically protects us while exposing us to the politics of perception, shifting the popularity and decay of skin bleaching and tanning products. The perception of skin tones have changed over time, showing the unstable relationship between class and race, as well as the human obsession with bodily appearance. Tanning gummy bears allow now light-skinned humans to metabolize the color of the sun while or without sitting under it. They are just another wave of food supplements to alter skin from the inside out. Bodies have become filtering devices. Humans and animals are disposable hosts of synthetic color. Humans struggle to imagine a species detached from its color even when we are the ones who detach it. Shifting cues in flesh, scales, skins, and feathers are clues to the metabolic metamorphosis around and inside us. Life in the chromatmosphere denies salmon the right to their own colors. As diets and desires transform plant and animal bodies, we need to learn the struggle of living with and within color. 
After all, we color the chrome atmosphere, and the world is already saturated. Salmon, the color, is, is a color, but it's also the color of a wild fish that is neither wild, nor fish, nor even salmon. After decades of overfishing, exhaustive salmon farming, and color leaks, Sky's waters have reached a point where seasonal productivity, ecology, and employment need to be rethought. Food seasons, as we know them, have ceased to exist. In a supermarket, you can find strawberries in the winter, tomatoes in the autumn, or even salmon filling the shelves all year round. You have all seasons. Beyond this flattened, continuous, 365-day-long season, what would be the new periods we could eat according to today? If humans have been changing environments, how can we also change our food system to adapt to them and build other landscapes? Climafor expo explores how to eat as humans change climate, a form of devouring that follows the consequences of anthropogenic landscape affected by intensive forms of extraction. Different from carnivore, omnivore, locavore, vegetarian or vegan diets, it is not so much the ingredients that define climavore, but rather the infrastructural responses to human-induced climatic events. New seasons of food production and consumption have begun to appear. Climavore aims to rethink the environmental futures of coastal inhabitation and the coastal commons through a diet that can effectively transform desires and infrastructure. In the case of polluted shores by salmon farms in Scotland, we takes the, the, it takes the tidal zone as an ambiguous site that appears and disappears and constantly changes in size. The littoral must be kept as a liminal zone because coastal space has no clear definition but opens up for murky yet cleaner usership and can become today the entrance into a new ecology, economy and imaginary. Alternative aquacultures can become then a space of opportunity for the tidal commons. Human-induced climatic alterations of the raw water, ranging from increasing acidification of the ocean, appearances of new parasites and disappearance of species, need to be rethought through other forms of eating and sourcing of nutrients that challenge extractive aquaculture. Different from intensive farming that produces an excess of nitrogen, other creatures do opposite processes they clean the water by breathing. Um, and so do other filter feeder um, scallops and clams and razor clams, barnacles, but also seaweeds like kelp, sea lettuce or dolls. They are incredible sources of easy access protein without the need for feed, medication or fertilizers. Despite having lost connection today to some of these ingredients, they were abundant and used by both humans and animals. Archaeological remains of prehistoric sheep in Scotland have marks in their teeth that indicate a kelp-based diet. And even in modern times, a booming industry in Skye has emerged for kelp-based explosives during the Napoleonic War in the 1920s. Kelp was used to nourish poor soils for millennia. In places like Jersey in the Channel Islands, the use of seaweed as fertilizer had been a common practice uh, with laws explicitly regulating the um, collective uh, usership and also the optimal seasons for its gathering. Certain varieties like kelp or bladderwreck uh, has abundant, abundant quantities of minerals that once laid on the fields would slowly be released and accelerate the growth of uh, tubers. Crafters have also used the tidal zone not only for fish traps, where all sorts of fish would be caught by the low tide, but also forage dulse and eat it raw or boiled in soup. Over century, food sourcing from the intertidal zone enabled social structures where women were the strength of fishing economies, from sorting oysters on the beach, lifting the catch, to carrying their husbands to shore. After sourcing oysters from naturally occurring beds, it was later discovered that they could be grown on oyster tables, structures going hundreds of meters into the sea where oysters are washed following uh, moon cycles. On the Isle of Skye, our oyster table has been functioning as a dining table to open up the discussion around other aquacultures that could happen. Every day, at high tide, the structure allowed its oysters, mussels, seaweeds to breathe 
one when, while one oyster can filter up to 120 liters of seawater per day. At low tide, the oyster table emerges above the sea and functions as a dining table where we placed some humans. Over breakfast, lunch, or dinner, according to the tides, performative meals feature a series of climavore ingredients, where work workshops with fishermen, politicians, residents, and scientists have been held to discuss another cultural imaginary for the island. Guests enjoyed bloody oyster merry cocktails, crunchy shingles, or lasagna, for sure, amongst other many climavore delights. Aiming to divest away from salmon farming on the island and develop alternative and regenerative aquacultures, a network of restaurants was also established uh, whereby each replaced farmed salmon with a climavore dish. Uh, a food truck, a local bakery, a Michelin star restaurant, a bar, hotel. Um, they all served different climavore dishes from climavore dal soup to cocoa kelp climavore ice cream twice dived climavore scallops or climavore rope grown mussel nibbles. And the restaurant for us is important to go back to the origins, the etymological origins of restaurant, which is, used to be an establishment in 19th century Paris called the Bouillon Restaurant, where you would get that bouillon, a restorative soup to warm up the body. And we see the space of the restaurant today as the site to actually not only restore the human body, but to restore ecology at large. At the core of our project and exhibition, Salmon and Red Herring, at Tate Britain, this movement was expanded with Tate's removal of salmon across its menus in all restaurants and cafes throughout the four sites in perpetuity, and the introduction of a climavore dish and a menu instead. This consisted of seaweed-based dishes instead of farmed salmon, and also a new beer produced with Kulin Brewery in Skye that used oyster shells for carbonization and kelp in its brewing processes. For our Turner Prize exhibition last year, we expanded this project and worked with more than 20 museums across the UK that all became climavore, removing farmed salmon off their menu and introducing climavore menus. In Skye, the Climavore Station is a coastal heritage platform that acts as a catalyst to divest the island away from farm salmon and promote regenerative aquaculture instead. So part of the educational mission of the platform is actually to train and secure placements for teenagers from the local cooking school to become the next generation of um, Climavore cooks and also get a placement in the partner restaurants that remove uh, salmon. And through these pedagogical and professional development, the future cooks of the island can then start introducing a new coastal imaginary. The climb of our station also develops a host of new cultivation techniques for an intertidal polyculture farm, or a sea croft, that will host a multiplicity of species growing as an ecology. The replicable and scalable model can become a multi-test site and a pedagogical space for coastal communities. After doing water surveys, we've made the first seeding experiment in Sky in collaboration with local marine biologists, testing out different materials and textures for the seaweed to attach to them. From the waste streams that aggregate from the consuming mussels and oyster shells, the climb of our station also investigates new materials that are being developed in Sky to reduce the amount of food waste going to the landfill. Instead, we have been collecting waste shell from local restaurants and transformed them into new building materials without cement or petro petrochemical resins. Through these many metabolic interactions, the, the tidal zone becomes a space of opportunity for discussing the spatial constructions of the ocean and its shores, and to rethink coastal policy and facilitate small-scale independent initiatives, the climate of station also works across education, farming, materials, oral histories, and legal action, as it also provides advice on how to open your own oyster or seaweed farm. Slowly, people coming up the sky would ask for sky kelp, sky dolls, sky oysters, or sky mussels, ingredients that regenerate the coast by breathing in this era of increasingly evident man-induced climatic events. On the tidal zone, we can determine what we eat 
as humans change climates. Thank you. Thank you.